Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm delighted to say I'm here with Sol Luckman. Uh, Sol is a, I'm going to read this from his Substack because it made me laugh when I read it earlier. Uh, Sol is a pioneering visual artist, award-winning novelist and humorist, and best-selling author of non-fiction books on health, spirituality, and consciousness. A confessed beached, a hot beachaholic and obsessive cultural creative, Sol Luckman has thumbed his nose at mainstream values and society ever since he can remember. Preferring hard play over a so-called honest day's work these days. In the new abnormal, he spends his time on a new small island, mostly body surfing, painting and writing, not necessarily in that order and usually not all at once. And while on permanent vacation, he became a multi-award winning and international best-selling author and prolific professional artist is anyone's guess. <laughs> uh so welcome to the show thanks for having me richard yeah um i mean just reading that i'm I'm already thinking how has he pulled that off just just the life that you lead uh seems to be you know a major com- accomplishment in itself uh let alone all of the great work you've done on exploring you know how we can heal um so yeah i really am excited to to get into this conversation with you yeah if you told me to Two uh, or you know, twenty years ago, when I was really sick, uh, in that that time frame, that I would be living this life, I would have said, "You're joking. You're absolutely joking." Because I, I was really not on my, not on my path with heart, not in my dharma. I was very lost in 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 the wilds of materialism and um, and in skepticism and that kind of thing. And uh, and now here I am, very different world that I'm living in. Yeah. Um, well, well, maybe we, we should start there in terms of your, yeah, your personal arc. Um, and, and yeah, just describe to us the, the sickness that you just mentioned. Uh, and uh, well, I, I suppose the story of the book I've read, and I know you've got a wealth of work, um, but the book I've read is, is potentiate your DNA. Um, but yeah, that what ultimately led you to, to these discoveries are, around DNA, but, but maybe start with, you know, where you were at the low point sure you know i was i was a, a graduate student i was at an ivy league school working on a phd in literature and i was slated to go this is back in the 90s i was going to brazil for dissertation research and i got my travel recommended travel jabs uh like a, a good little sheeple and and within uh, a short period of time after that, my health and life absolutely exploded, just just fell apart. And I went on into a kind of dark night of the soul for the better part of a decade where I, 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 lost, I lost my health. I lost my ability to eat most foods. I was allergic to everything. I lost my friends. I, I ended up losing my path as a, a student because I couldn't stay on it health-wise. And I I went in search of answers. I um, I I moved out west uh, to uh, New Mexico, studied Qigong with someone who had healed himself of chronic fatigue syndrome and uh, you know a, a condition with a lot of similarities to what I was experiencing. I would also say that mine had elements of uh, what would be called fibromyalgia, uh, multiple chemical sensitivities. So I was really I was really a basket case with all of that, and I I just happened to end up in New Mexico following this strange path of energy where I began to understand the nature of energy and that helped get me back on my feet. It didn't cure me or heal me, but it helped me fortify myself enough so, so that I could go on with, with a quasi-normal life for a little while where I, I taught English. And during that phase, I had some other health problems coming uh, come up uh, that had to do with uh, some some dental problems that just through antibiotics after taking antibiotics I that just absolutely wrecked my immune system and I went right back down and went even lower and I was really I felt like kind of almost at death's door and that was when I stumbled on the world of energy or allergy elimination technique a type of energy clearing. It was pioneered by doctors Debbie Nambudrapad and Ellen Cutler back in the 
well, in the 90s, in the early 90s. And that helped me a lot. And it was another lesson in the way that energy works and the way the body can respond to pure energetic input. So I did that for a while. It helped me with some of my allergic situations. It restored elements of my functionality until I plateaued and actually started going back down again. I kept hitting these walls. And at that point in time, I was prompted to begin exploring the the notion that maybe I wasn't going deep enough with the clearing process, that I was working kind of at the level of the nervous system, working homeopathically in a sense with this clearing protocol that was introducing energetic frequencies to my nervous system that was then doing a kind of clearing using the acupressure system in the body, the the meridian system. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that, uh, was a real eye-opener for me when I began to think about the the genetic component of all of this and how, how we might go down into the genetic blueprint level or the inner genetic blueprint level and possibly reset it, reboot it so that it would start functioning normally again and one could get out of a state of what might be called autoimmunity into more of a normal relationship with the environment and with one's own body. So I looked at DNA. I looked at the relationship between sound and DNA, the relationship between sound language and DNA. Specifically, I began to do a lot of research into vowels and their relationship to, to DNA and to the, the, uh, the nucleotides of DNA and RNA, the nucleotide bases. So I, I discovered that A-E-I-O-U in English, that ends up corresponding to the five nucleotides. And it's very fascinating. It's as if English is some kind of distillation of the of uh of the primary vowel sounds that end up <laughs> that end up resonating with dna so my theory was that you could somehow use vowels using sound healing use the sound using the sound of your own voice to speak to your dna and beyond that to what i came to understand as the inner genetic blueprint that actually gives rise to dna so that there's there's first there's a wave there's a blueprint there's an energetic substratum that coalesces through dna into physical form into biological form so i i pursued this line of reasoning i i was really sick at the time and my partner and i she, her name is lee she was helping me with all of this research and all of this work we we uh, said goodbye to my family i thought i was possibly saying goodbye really goodbye because i was very ill at the time we traveled back to South America and had a variety of, for lack of a better word, or mystical experiences that led us forward on this path until we were, uh, we were able to download, I use that term kind of mm-hmm. loosely, but we were given these codes, these vowel codes for doing just that, for reprogramming that, that energetic blueprint. And when we, when we, performed those codes for ourselves, we both began detoxing like crazy and having all kinds of other experiences. And our bodies started changing. My, my allergies started shifting. I went from not being able to eat anything but unseasoned meat and vegetables to being able to eat like carbs and all kinds of other things in a very short period of time. And my body really needed that because it needed the substance it needed something to bind up the toxins that wanted to release. So uh, like healthy starches are actually very important in that level of detoxification because they provide a kind of buffer zone and an escort mechanism for these, these toxins. And they take them out through, generally speaking, the bowels uh, out of the body. And that clears enough space so that you can stop with the heavy duty reactivity um, as you're as you're fortifying yourself in different ways, so that was my my path into the healing ramp, and that just went up and up and up and up for years. Really, I, I mean, I keep getting stronger and um, and younger in a way in my body, even though I've continued to age on the outside. I feel in many ways stronger and more flexible than I did when I was a an athlete in my twenties. Yeah. And that's the important part of your story, right? You you started off in, as a specimen. It sounds like from the book, right? You were... yeah, it was pretty good. I mean, you know, I I wasn't um, 
I wasn't the biggest guy in the world or the strongest or the fastest, but I had some talent. I played quarterback for the my football team and um, I was a really good basketball player. And, you know, I used to, when I was in graduate school, I would play basketball against the, 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 uh, the team, the university basketball team players in the off season, they would come into the gym and we would play. And I, I could, you know, I could really hold my own. And that was, that was, uh, that was gratifying, but that was also, that was right before everything kind of went away. And, and I might, you know, my health, uh, took a nosedive and I didn't, I didn't do that for a very long time, but now, you know, for the last number of years, I mean, I, I regularly, my body surf. I do, I do, I mean, I do really funny things. I, I have a pole in my house, like a, a, like a pole dancing pole that I do pole conditioning on. I would never call myself a pole dancer, but it's the most amazing conditioning and stretching in the world. It's just unbelievable. In Are fact, you one of these guys, you could hold yourself sideways on the pole. Yeah, I really can. Yeah. You know, the awesome. that that entire thing, I know it's been kind of um lowered to this level in, in pop culture of strip clubs and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But the actual discipline originated in India a very long time ago and was a I form of gymnastics. It was gymnastics. Right. And so they, they would perform all of this crazy stuff on these on these usually like slick wooden poles. And uh, and that was that was where it all started. And and you can see the really good old people. You can go online and see a lot of these dancers. And you can if you can separate out some of the uh, some of the sexiness of it and just look mm. at the athleticism, it's it's kind of unbelievable what they're doing. And I'm uh, I can tell you right now, I will never be at any of those levels. But I've learned to do I mean, I can climb the pole. I can go sideways. I can I can do various spins. I can, you know, do just, you know, some kind of interesting things that that just work the body but you can also just use that as a as a resistance for doing all kinds of pull-ups and other things that uh stretch and and strengthen the body right yeah awesome okay now i i think that for well let me start so when I read the book, what I really resonated with was when you laid out this idea of era one era two and era three in terms of how we think about healing. Um, and I figure where I'm at is I'm like using era two. <laughs> and mm. and we'll get into what those those means. That, that, that those, but but they, the the next level, like era, when, we, when we're talking about this sort of transpersonal, you know, engaging in in these uh, this idea of of energy and uh in the way that you talk about energy, um yeah, you know, I feel like this 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 book has kind of met me at my level in terms of 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 where I'm at, and and it's got me really curious about what that can be. So I'm thinking, what the next, you know, what what, what a different way to view health and being human could look like. Um, so so I'm wondering if you could, yeah, just lay out what these phases are: era one, era two, era three, uh, and then then we could sort of start to explore. Some of the terms you've used here, like you know, energy healing and energy clearing, uh, and so on, in the context of that era three, uh, I suppose paradigm. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. I mean, congratulations. I mean, once you actually open Pandora's box of thinking of non-local consciousness and spirit in relationship in relationship to yourself, that's uh, you know, it's kind of like in shamanism. You'll never have a uh, another day off. Because, you know, it's such an exploration and such a commitment to following that path of transformation and ultimately transcendence, if you want to mm -hmm. take it that far. Um, in terms of eras one, two, and three, yeah, in Potentiate Your DNA, I, I use as a starting point Dr. Larry Dossie's schematic from his wonderful book, Reinventing Medicine, where he talks about the history of medicine from a certain perspective of eras, eras one, two, and three. And for him, era one is early Western medicine where we, and he's looking at this from a Western perspective. He's a, he's a cardiologist, so that's yeah. his optic. And a wonderful writer too. He sees era one as a, a mechanistic form of medicine where the body is treated as a machine so that you you have something wrong you you give it a substance you uh you know you get 
pivot drugs, you you cut it, you burn it, you stretch it, you massage it, whatever. But you're just looking at it as a meat suit. Yeah. And that, of course, has a, a certain resonance when you look at, at um, when you look at the notion of energy. There is kind of no energy. That's completely that's completely localized in the body. There's no there's no acknowledgement of mind body. There's no acknowledgement of consciousness. And that corresponds that era one phase in the development of medicine corresponds to the old paradigm of genetics, where the nucleus is the brain of the cell, that it controls uh, everything that that we have. This is where we get genetic uh, uh, predeterminism, uh, where we end up with, you know, all of these genetic quote unquote genetic diseases that are supposedly passed along and that sort of thing and we have no control over it. it's just a crapshoot uh we're in life lottery that sort of thing so era two was an outgrowth of that for people who found that frustrating or saw that there was more to the story and this this would be related to uh the rise of let's say um the whole field of psychology and psychiatry, the work mm. of people like Carl Jung would have contributed to this this elevation of our understanding of ourselves to see that we are not just a body, but we are a mind body, that we are we are both the mind and a body at the same time, and that they interrelate in all kinds of different ways, and that the, the mind can be used to affect the body, to heal the body, that you have, uh, you know, the power of positive thinking, like with Norman Vincent Peale. And uh, we also have the work of epigenetics, as yep. being by people like Bruce Lipton, where it's very clear that we are constantly interacting with our environment. It's not just the DNA that's handing us a script for the rest of our lives. We're actually controlling a lot of our genetic expression by interacting with our environment. The brain is not really in the in the nucleus. It's more like in the membrane of the cell, and uh, it's a, a, a kind of a radical departure from tr traditional genetic understanding. So that's that's fascinating. It's very empowering. It's um, it probably gave rise to things like law of attraction, uh, secret, a lot of manifestation concepts, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, people's work who are out there in, in personal growth and improvement. A lot of the big names, Wayne Dyer, other people, you know, we're looking at that model and we're very inspired by it. But Dossie is so brilliant. He understands that there's even more to the, to the picture here, more another piece to the puzzle. And that's era three. And this is where we begin to see that even though we are as an individual, we are a mind body, there is a spiritual component to ourselves that is even greater and more important, more primary to the expression of our lives. And that is that is this spiritual aspect. He calls that era three or the non-local aspect of ourselves. And yes, you could call it God, you could call it spirit, you could call it the creator, you could call it many, many things. Uh, and Whatever you call it, you're just giving it a name to conceptualize it because we can't really even understand what that is. I believe that is the mystery. That's what we will never actually wrap our minds around because it's beyond our minds. It is yeah. a spiritual level. It's the experiential level, the, the ultimate energetic level, the power level in shamanism, for example. So in era three, when you when you heal or when you do anything, really, you're you're not doing it yourself you are becoming a vessel for something else. Now, of course, the, the irony, the poetic irony of this is that ultimately you are a part of that something else. <laughs> so you make this giant circle, you're like the Ouroboros fighting its own tail. You are the Alpha and the Omega yourself in a way. Yeah. But, but in your personal experience, you're, you're experiencing it as you and you're letting that flow through you. So he really looked into how various studies of prayer for example larry dossi has books on the healing power of prayer one of them is called healing words and he was he was curious to understand how this could work 
And he could only explain it to himself by looking at consciousness as ultimately non-local, as not even being in the brain at all. He's got an article on this that I republished with his permission on my blogs. And we are, we are healing at, a, at an absolutely non-personal level, a level that does not respect time or distance, meaning we can get into retrocausality, we can get into healing the disease before it happened, we can do all kinds of amazing things by looking at the body this way. And for him, uh, he didn't go here, but I went here. I, I called this level not genetic, not epigenetic, but metagenetic. Right. And I related this to the notion that before there is DNA, there is a wave. Mm. David Wilcock went into this in some of his earlier books. I'm not so wild about his later stuff, but his earlier books like the, uh, is it the Synchronicity Key went into this in some depth, and he did a really wonderful job of showing how the, there is a lot of research suggesting that the DNA emerges from some kind of portion waveform in the substratum, in the blueprint level, and that it, then it materializes. So that is, that is potentially evidence for this idea that we emerge from spirit. Right. And, and when you say we, we as a, as an expression of DNA, there's this really important link that it, 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 it's expressed through the DNA. Is, is that the idea? Yeah. It's almost as if the DNA itself, while it's a marvelous code and a, uh, a, you know, a fascinating concept. I mean, it's very, DNA itself is very controversial these days. I'm, I don't want to necessarily get into that discussion, but some, somehow there is a translation process that goes from pure potential in spirit to actual manifestation in our experience of life and our bodies. Mm. And the, the current prevailing theory is that the, our, our bodies, our experiences are produced by our DNA. So, you know, ergo, you go from spirit to the body by way of DNA. So if you want to reach back to spirit, let's say that's the blueprint level where the idea of our body is stored, right? Yeah. If you want to get back to that and correct, let's say, some kind of dysfunction that's going on or something, uh, a trauma that has been lodged and stored over there in that auric field or that Akashic record or whatever you want to call it, then you have to go back through the DNA to get there. So how do you do that? And this is where my research into sound, language, and vowels comes in. Apparently, you can use frequency, cymatics, language, codes that somehow speak to the DNA to access and alter the blueprint level and then once you alter that, the blueprint does what it does. It flows back to the DNA and it begins to make changes in this side, in this side of the equation. Right. Wow. I mean, it is, it's, it is a, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a challenging idea because I'm, I'm situated as I really, the way you've laid it out very much in that era too. And I've done a lot of healing work and, and all of all of it's been around, you know, the mind body and understanding my connection to mind body and working through my emotional traumas. Not once in this whole, I suppose, fifteen years of healing that I've been engaged in have I considered this this element. Um, but yeah, I mean, DNA was just to me something while well, I inherited it from my parents, and that's what I've got. And it's sort of it's it, it, it it's um, determined my physicality. Uh, and uh, uh, but on top of that, I have experienced traumas which I've healed through therapy. Um, but I haven't considered that there's a kind of a dynamic relationship between me and my DNA and 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 a spiritual dimension. It's 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 uh, yeah. I'm, I'm wrapping my head around it real time. Right, right, right. Yeah, it is challenging for some people. I think some people just have a problem embracing the notion of a spiritual dimension you know they can go to the mind body piece but it's it's hard to even uh really buy into that because i would say that the greater part of our 
world culture is devoted to denying the existence of such a thing and to making fun of people who believe in it and talk about it. Yeah. And, and when did that hat shift happen to you? Because were you pretty much in era one, you know, uh, you know, what, what was your sort of progression through those areas? If we stick to that, you know, schematic for a second. Sure, sure. Yeah. And I will say that, um, I see this progression in a lot of people that I've worked with or people who've read my books and that kind of thing. So there seems to be, this seems to be a little bit archetypal, a little bit normal for people as they mm. go, go through what you might call an awakening process. I mean, that makes it sound so, I don't know, narcissistic, but I don't, we don't have a lot of language for what this process is, but maybe it's just opening yourself up to exploring what it is and ultimately exploring, you know, things that appear mysterious in the, in the world, the way it works. But my, my process was that, yes, when I was younger, when I was in graduate school, I mean, you know, the graduate schools are the great cathedrals of materialism and of scientific skepticism and that kind of thing. So even even that that um, that uh, thought that way of thinking totally influences also the the languages the the study of language uh, of linguistics of literature mythology folklore everything has been kind of reduced to some kind of superficial pseudo scientific sociological type of study of all of these mysteries and it's really just a massive joke and I believe it's a it is a purposeful dumbing down program so that people don't tap into their greater potential. Mm. Having said that, I, yes, I was, I was very much there, even though there were parts of me that, that I was interested in certain things that you might call um, a little bit alternative. I had a mother who was into this kind of thing. I also kind of poo pooed it and was in denial. And I, I really embraced the kind of materialistic paradigm until I got sick. And that was the real turning point for me. And that happens with so many people. I have, I've written about how illness can be a teacher. I actually write about that in Potentiate Your DNA. And it's a real har harsh taskmaster too. It's, um, it's very, it's, it can be very, 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 very intense. So the first thing I did was I stumbled into the world of mind body. And I began looking through that lens at what was happening to me. And yes, I did, I did the things I did various types of self-help and using my mind and affirmations and positive thinking and meditation and all these other things. And what I, what I discovered personally, and I've seen this replicated with a lot of people, and I'm not saying it's universal, but I'm saying it's, it's common enough to know that, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire in this case, that those techniques are limited more often than not, I believe. They actually can help with symptoms, they can get people back on their feet, but I'm not convinced that that they ever, that they, that they, I'm not convinced that they commonly take people to the next level entirely, where you're just, you're just doing something different besides healing. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's and that's kind of life, where I feel like I'm at. Healing, right? And mm. I see that with so many people, and they've done so many things, and I did that, and I spent all this money and tried all, you know, and it just didn't work. And I would, I would keep going kind of up and down, but I never had that feeling that I've had for the last two decades since doing Regenetics that I just, I keep healing, I keep strengthening, I keep improving in a lot of ways. Not to say that I never have challenges. Now that's, that's not what I'm saying at all. But there's just an overall sense of, of having more and more energy at my disposal to work with, to heal with, to create with, and that kind of thing. You were, you were mentioning at the very beginning, uh, having to do with my bio, you know, how, how do you do all that or something like that? And it, yeah. really it's an energy thing. It's a, it's an energy piece. So I did that until, until I realized I, I was spinning my wheels and I opened myself up. I don't know why exactly, but I just, found myself opening up to this other possibility that I was missing a big piece and that the big piece had something to do with something very mysterious <laughs> that I've been calling spirit that that's the, the shamans would call it spirit uh, very often a lot of uh, native native uh, American traditions would call it spirit or great spirit I, I like that because it's kind of neutral um, and I began pondering what one could do how one might interact with that realm because it's so vast and mysterious and then i looked at various traditions that have to do with sound and the power of sound i mean 
goodness gracious, in the beginning was the word, you know, I mean, it was like staring me in the face. And I began looking at the Popol Vuh and other <laughs> old texts. The, the uh, what? And purple, purple what? Sorry. Like from the Mayan tradition, you know, where it, okay. there's, a whole, there's a whole bit in there about the, the power of, uh, of, of language and sound to create life. And, okay. you know, it's just amazing how, how this is embedded over and over again in so many places in both the mainstream spiritual and religious texts and in the apocrypha it's all over the place you get it in the hermetic literature it shows up in the mesoamerican stuff it's just everywhere so i, I began to realize that oh my god uh, sound is massively important here even in the beginning was the word and okay is is a kind of coded message and it really means that the what, oh, let me go let me use a different different example let there be light and god said let there be light now that sounds like oh god that's era two it's light it's a, an idea the world's being created it's epigenetic that's how a lot of people would interpret that oh light light therapy that's the most important thing but that's not what's going on in that statement because god said he yeah. spoke it and then there was light so really, that is a, an encapsulation of what I'm talking about, where you start with spirit, and then there is some kind of energetic transfer, and that spirit, that sound, becomes light, or becomes this holographic reality that we inhabit. Right. Right. And, and this came to you in a, in a download. Is that, this, this is something that was, you, was bequeathed to you as, as you see it, is that right? Well, I had a lot of teachers, a lot of inspiration. I had a lot of, you know, physical teachers, a lot of books that I read. I was given pieces in dreams by just a random snippet of conversation. <laughs> I was I was working with a lot of clients because I was performing this allergy elimination technique for other people. Sometimes they would give me pieces. I was doing a lot of kinesiological work with these clients and looking at their patterns and i was i was doing testing for how the different sounds would relate to their dna and all of that so there was so much going on i mean this was kind of my life for a while and then i i felt like i i had enough conceptually speaking to try to do this thing of resetting the energy blueprint but, but i wasn't sure how to do it uh, because i didn't really have any any actual codes for doing that you know if you think of this as a computer program that you're trying to reset i mean you know i'm trying to hack this system i still didn't really know how to do it i knew that it could be done or i felt like that it could be done and you know i felt like i knew sort of how that would play out what, what it was like what what the components were but i didn't really have the, the actual numbers the or the vowels the words or whatever and that was what was ultimately given in a download that I would not lay claim to. Right. And that by, well, you, you use this expression, si singing to your DNA. Is that right? Well, and, and singing these very specific sounds or, or codes. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. we're able to repotentiate re our DNA. Well, and I suppose that that's worth defining. <laughs> so so what, what happens when we, when we make these chants of these specific sounds? Yeah, well, I don't know exactly what happens. Um, we're, okay. there's, two, there's two components to it. One is a, a sequence of vowels. Well, there's, there's sort of three components. You're singing at a certain note, first of all, with potentiation, right. for example. It is, it is 528 hertz. That's the me note from the solfeggio scale. I've What's got the a, solfeggio I've, scale? What's that? Solfeggio scale. I've got a few different articles um, on my Substack, which is solluckman.substack.com, and you can look up solfeggio, and that's S-O-L-F-E-G-G-I-O. -E Very controversial thing uh, in some certain ways, but the it, this is an uh, is purported to be a very ancient scale that was hidden away by the church a, a long time ago. There are theories that the old chants like the gregorian chants and that kind of thing were really designed to heal and fortify the body in ways that are possibly similar to what we're talking about here and that they changed the the frequency the note and made it they took it from a healing frequency into a damaging frequency mm. uh, so 
one can look into all of that. But anyway, we're talking about a specific note. And then we're talking about specific sequences of vowels that you sing using that note that you chant in a certain way. And then and that while you're chanting those notes, you're thinking a corresponding series of vowels. So you're literally singing and thinking possibly different vowels at the same time. Right. So there's a there's a bit of a learning curve for people who want to do this themselves, but people all over the world have done it. I mean, thousands of people have learned how to do this. And it really puts you in the kind of very interesting meditative state where you're just singing along and you and you're thinking along. There sometimes the notes, the vowels will line up and sometimes they'll be different. And you progress through this activation. It takes the whole thing takes under 30 minutes to do. You do it one time. And then the experience of that lasts for just over nine months. And that's it's kind of curious because it's like a gestation cycle where you're being born or kind of reborn in a sense energetically. During that time, one can experience breakthroughs. One can experience a lot of energy surges. One can go through detoxification, release. You can, I mean, you can detox through bowels, you know, sinuses, sweat. I mean, you know, whatever. I remember at one point in time, not to be too um, graphic, but I remember I had these white sheets that just just turned absolutely brown on me uh, when I was doing some sweating, and it was just clear a lot of really wild stuff I was coming out. So that can happen. And at some point in time, if you have, uh, and I'm not making any medical claims here, but I'm just giving you my experience and, and, and the, uh, and reports from a lot of people who have experienced this work, you begin to, you can begin to experience windows where you might feel normal if you've been sick or if you've had allergies or, uh, different reactions or other problems or pain or stiffness or lack of energy. You might just suddenly you'll release a bunch of stuff and maybe that's a little bit challenging because this stuff really is toxic and when it moves you can feel it moving and it can create pain sometimes or uh, other other issues but after it moves out people report what we call a window very often where oh oh my god i can't believe it i can't believe that i'm not experiencing this allergy or that i feel like I did before any of this stuff started, you know, and maybe that goes away when you start to detox again and you go through cycles. The the general process is that the windows expand and get more frequent. Yeah. And, and, and as you relay this, I mean, I've, I've had experiences when I, I I remember I went on a raw food, purely organic raw food diet, uh, vegan raw food, organic, uh, and I had this huge detoxification. Um, and I've also had detoxification when I've worked at the emotional level and i've done you know done an emotional therapy and um and worked through a lot of my past trauma but i i where i really resonate with you is i i still have this sense that there's there's more there's this is getting me so far but you'd use the term earlier limited right and i've i've just my intuition is telling me that these approaches are somehow limited and what Mm. you know and then, yeah, I've got kind of tickled by this idea of this spiritual realm. And, and so my interest in telling me is like, keep looking there. And, and this is what I find kind of exciting. And, I, and as you talk, I'm, I'm reminded of when I first got into therapy, I had like similar feelings. Oh, should I give, should I give this a go? Is this all woo woo? What is it? Am I going to be wasting my money? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Did it, had all the benefits. But now, like, I feel like I'm on a similar precipice of like okay you know maybe there's a, a sort of another level of of surrender and you know, just sort of take the step and and uh and 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 go for this right where i'm 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 giving up this idea that sort of i can fix myself and actually this is about surrendering to something else yeah i like that i like that you put it that way i think that's that's what it is it is, it is a kind of surrender and getting outside of your head i mean one of the issues if if you look at some of the core precepts of of shamanism, one of the one of our biggest challenges as people is self importance and a kind of narcissism that we're mm. that we're trained into. Really, you know, it's not as if we're to blame for that because it's really the system that we're born into that that cultivates that in us. And you know, it's 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 a, it's one one thing to create from that perspective, and it's a totally different thing to create when you're you're really not focalizing in 
in that discrete self, you're, you're, you're really aware of a relationship with something much greater than yourself. And I think you can create, you know, orders of magnitude, larger creations by doing it in the, in the latter way. And healing is much greater uh, when you, when you approach it from that direction. And I think we're always leveling up. I think we're always, if, if we're willing to walk uh, such a path that we're, I don't know that there's an end we, we, we keep, we keep making discoveries and realizing that there is maybe another level at all times. I think ultimately in an infinite creation an intimate multiverse cosmos, it couldn't be any other way, really. Mm -hmm. And, and just to talk again, so you said you, you're not quite sure how exactly it works, but, but to summarize, you know, your understanding of, of like, of the, of the process from 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 going from chanting these vowels or simultaneously thinking them to to experiencing you know all of the, all of the benefits that that can come from this process well, yeah what what do you think is is going on hmm. yeah i mean anything i say is going to be just a a kind of approximation you know yeah because what's happening is is ultimately mysterious because it's very mm. difficult to understand that level of blueprints because um it's it's outside of our cognition you know what i'm saying it's not yeah. really i mean we can theorize about it you know i mean i'm and i'm not the only person theorizing about this there's um a, a russian scientist who passed away a couple of years ago named peter Garayev. i was in correspondence with him for years and he he, he was his work has been nominated for a nobel prize uh in science Absolutely fascinating stuff. And he, he developed what he called wave genetics. And I make the case in Potentiate Your DNA that regenetics is a, is a human potential based form of something like wave genetics, where you're acknowledging that the genetic apparatus is actually being guided by some kind of hyperspatial template right. of information. And that's exactly what he was saying. He was also saying, that the way you access that hyperspatial template is through sound and frequency and language. Right. And he was able to actually regrow like canine teeth doing this. Wow. And is he the, the same guy who changed, flipped the embryo of like yes. a newt to a frog or something or yes. salamander to a frog? Absolutely. But they were able to take, uh, you know, I, I always get this wrong. I wish I could remember it, but it's either fr frog to frog to a salamander or salamander to frog. But either <laughs> way, they took an embryo and they they used their uh, link their genetic linguistic radio frequency technology. But this is what they were developing to beam at that egg, that embryo uh, in, in in I guess you know in the in the egg, and they basically instructed it to change its species. So if you're a frog, become a salamander or vice versa. And lo and behold, that's what happened. I mean, that so is, that is absolutely mind-blowing. And, and what I suppose surprised me when I read that, I was like, how, how do I not know that? I mean, I mean, you know, I like to read. I like, you know, I, I've watched the news. How has that been fated? Yeah, as, well, as first a, of all, incredible well, it, has been, it has been replicated, I will say that. But, you, okay. I mean, let, let's understand the world that we live in. And that is not because I'm skeptical about that, what, of the claim. That, that, if, if that's real, that is the end of medicine as we know it. It's the end of big pharma as we know it. It's the end of therapy as we know it. It's the end of all things that we consider to be scientific. Right. Because it, it, it would usher in an utterly different paradigm for what we are and how we can heal and how we can become as individuals and as a society. Right. So there's no way anything like that would actually be acknowledged. And it would be, you know, they would introduce disinformation. They would claim that it never happened, that it was flawed, that it was this, that it was whatever. But, you know, you have ongoing replications of a lot of these types of studies and uh, other people continuing this research. He, like I said, he passed away a couple of years ago. Peter did. And, um, you know, it's absolutely amazing. So what I what I did with with lee what we did with regenetics was to take these ideas and say okay well we don't have 
that scientific background, we don't have funding, we don't have uh, machines that will do this, and we don't really know exactly what they're doing, even though I was in correspondence with them for a long time. Let's let's see what we can do as as people by opening up to that spiritual realm, acknowledging it, and seeing if we can speak to it. Can we ask it to change? Can we say, heal me? You know, if I've got a yeah. distortion, if I have a distortion in, in that 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 hyperspatial realm, would you just just tweak it and so that you know so that uh, my allergies go away or whatever? And I think the answer uh, to the question of whether that's possible is that it's absolutely possible. And we've watched it now for two, two decades happen for people all, all over the world. And we do we do sessions for people uh, at a distance typically, and it, that doesn't matter. Um, a lot of times people start to heal even when they schedule their appointment, you know, they, they haven't even had their session. So we know it's also, it doesn't really obey time. It's completely non-local in the Larry Dossie sense of the, of the, uh, of the concept. So yeah, we're talking to some extent retrocausality or retrocognition. And that's fascinating. I mean, you know, it's just really amazing to, to observe all of this. In the beginning, we were like, oh my God, this is incredible. And now it's almost it's almost boring. It's so common that it's just, we know this is how things work. This is, this is how energy in the world functions. Right. Right. And who, who doesn't it work on? That's another really interesting question. Uh, it works on people for whom it doesn't work uh, for reasons that are not always clear. Um, right. You know, I mean, and I've looked at this, from a lot of different perspectives. I've looked at it from people who are very shut down, maybe at a mental level, you know, they're not really open to it, but I think that's less important than being shut down at a kind of spiritual or emotional slash spiritual level. I think those are the people who have the, the biggest problem. Yeah. Uh, opening up to this. We've seen a lot of skeptical people who have a little bit of a devil may care attitude and they just try it for sure, whatever, you know, I'll see, you know, like a husband, you know, might do it with a wife or whatever. And they end up having more uh, benefits than the wife, you know, I mean, it's just, you just, just never know. So, so I, I don't think it's so much a mental blockage as it's something deeper for people. And I've examined the concept of things like soul contracts and other notions, e even in shamanism, you can have contracts that you make that you enter into just by vowing to do something when you're like a little kid. And you think that that, in retrospect, you may think that's innocent or I didn't know better or whatever, but shamanically speaking, that's a real contract. Right. Yeah. And unless you undo that energetically and consciously, it is controlling your life to a certain extent. Yeah. I, th I think you mentioned in the book, somebody who'd, experience from a teacher telling them they were no good at maths, right? And um, they completely shut down their mathematical ability. And then through your process, they, they completely come back alive uh, in terms of their love of maths. And I and think the, that was an amazing testimonial from somebody. Yeah. Who had yeah. 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 And uh, would that be a sort form of soul contract? Is that what you're talking about? I'm simply throwing that out as maybe a possible explanation for why some people don't experience the full benefits of this work right yeah interesting um and and where to next with this like is this is it, you know what, what what's the sort of state of the art with your of your research now is, is is there anything new you you've been learning most recently since you since you wrote the book uh let's see well, it might be it might be helpful for people to know that regenetics is actually a four step process that there's potentiation, which is the first activation, and that's followed potentially by three other activations. One's uh, called articulation, then elucidation, and then transcension. And we think of these activations as working at progressively deeper levels of what you might call the subtle anatomy. So you go from working on the, the quote unquote physical body in potentiation, although that can, that can 
that can induce a lot of emotional healing and mental healing and that kind of thing. But then you move into a more of a focus on the mental body, the mental aspect in articulation, more of the emotional aspect with elucidation, and more of the spiritual aspect with transcension. And um, I said that something along the lines of that's usually what you go go through in the process. But a lot of people have received tremendous benefits just by doing potentiation. Yes. So you don't necessarily have to commit to the to the full Monty to 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 make this happen for yourself to change your life in a really positive way. We do a in fact we we do this for free for people. The first Sunday of every month we do a worldwide potentiation ceremony that you can sign up for and experience this virtually and see how it goes for yourself. So um, that's that's an option. If you go to my Substack, I've got some new uh, new tools uh, for this work. Um, one is um, in addition to potentiate your DNA, I created a video tutorial called How to Potentiate Your DNA, and that's available. Uh, you can access that with a, a free seven day trial and go in and it's about an hour long or 50 minute video that's a wonderful, it's either a companion to potentiate your DNA or it's a standalone tutorial for how to do it. We also put in some really cool visualizers on the, on our sub stack. There's two visualizers for potentiation where it shows you the vowels that you're singing and thinking, and it kind of plays them in front of you in a video form so that you can just sing those as they, as they scroll across the screen. Right. <laughs> so when you're, when you're practicing, that's, that can be really, really helpful. And I also wrote a book, a, a little ebook uh, at the end of last year called Playing in the Magic, How to Manifest Whatever You Desire in the Simulation. And I go into some manifestation concepts, how to use your, in, how to access and energize your intention via intuition, empathy, and imagination to maximize this process for yourself. Right. Wow. Well, there's a, there's a word you use there, S simulation. H how do these ideas you know, relate to the idea that we're in a in a simulation? Yeah, they're they're very related to it. Um, whether you want to look at it as as a holographic construct, which a lot of people, like Carl Prebrum and other people, have been studying for years. Um, or if you want to think of this, you know, as um, if you want to look through the lens of quantum physics, you know, and you look, you start looking for what an atom is, and there's just n almost nothing there. Yeah. You know, that's very, very simulation like. You could say, you know, a lot of people are out there saying, you know, that we're actually in an, in, in a simulation. Something like a like a Nick Bostrom has done a lot of work on this, and there's a another scientist named i think his last name is hoffman he's been doing a lot of really good work on simulation theory for a long time it should probably be simulation hypothesis but people call it simulation theory and that's really the idea that we are in some kind of technological simulation not unlike tron or the matrix where we're actually projecting into avatars in a something like a video game and what whereas i don't i don't ascribe to that particular view it's also not something you can disprove necessarily in, in using using our current frames of reference or observation. I like what the shamans have to say about it. They say that we are in a dream and that the dream can, can be changed and we can become aware that we're dreaming and we can learn how to use our dreaming body uh, in very powerful ways to do all kinds of interesting things. I would recommend a wonderful book by a psychologist named Arnold may have been a psychiatrist as well, named Arnold Mendel called Dream Body. Fantastic. Dream Body. He, yeah. he developed process-oriented psychology years ago, and it's a fascinating book that really pays homage to this notion that you see in both Eastern and more Western or Mesoamerican shamanism that we are living in a kind of dream. It also, also taps into you know some, some of the uh, notions that you find in Aboriginal uh, understanding of the, the dream time, that sort of thing. So. However, you want to look at it. If if we are if there is some kind of um, energetic substrate, energetic baseline that we are being projected from, 
that's deeply holographic. Right. Right. And, and, and when you say holographic, I think of light, not sound. So is this holographic in one sense that we experience it, but behind that there's, there's a song? Is it, is it something like that? Uh, you put it beautifully, yes. And I would say that the holographic concept, you can ha absolutely have sound holograms. Okay. So, right. So, uh, so because you, then you get into kind of the, the fractal nature of reality too, right? Because the, you're looking at a system where the, it's a self-replicating system, a self-repeating, self-mirroring system. It, uh, it's a system where the, the whole is always contained in its parts. This yeah. is related to the idea that we have spirit in us, so that we are in some sense spirit, even though we appear to be a discrete self. So the entire construct here may be one in which some being, some consciousness has created a fractal reality by, by expanding its consciousness creatively and has created the multiverse the different worlds, the different holograms, the different simulations as, you know, as a way possibly to garner experience, to explore, who knows exactly. That's what the shamans think. They think that, that the, the creator uh, engendered, and I use that word from a genetic perspective, that it engendered this world as a way of knowing more about itself because it's infinite. And even though it is in, it is infinity, it's such a mind blowing concept that it could learn things about itself infinitely. Right. I mean, I say right because I'm not sure what other words to use. It. I mean, I this, know, what this do you mind, say? Mind you go into this territory. It's so. It's such a. I always say it's a noodle cooker. You know, it's a real noodle cooker. Yeah, it is a noodle cooker, and I. Th I yeah, and what I'm with is that it takes, at least for me, a certain level of courage to kind of be, to expose myself to these ideas, to go into these experiences, uh, yeah, with a certain faith that my intuition is leading me down the, the right path. And that's, it's been true up till now. And so, yeah, I'm feeling in a similar state now, right? It's like, okay, this, this resonates. My my intuition is telling me it's a is a is a good path. Let's let's explore. What is that wonderful quote? I'm I'm, I'm trying to recall it. Let's see if I can dig it out of my. Uh, so it's it's attributed to Goethe. It's whatever you can do or or dream you can begin it. Boldness has genius and power and magic in it. Yeah, I love that. Brilliant. I wonder if in fact my my kids have just got home, so maybe that's the perfect time to. To conclude this conversation, but yeah, this is this is this has been wonderful. Um, I'm now definitely inspired to to go explore this, uh, and I hope some of my listeners are too. Um, we'll put links to to the book, uh, which we've been focusing on, potentiate your DNA, um, to to your site um, and to the resources you you mentioned a few moments ago. I appreciate that, and it, I was really uh, looking forward to this, and wanted to thank you for for just uh, reaching out to me. Uh, I, I, I really appreciate that. No, I, I, I'm full of gratitude. Uh, thank, thank you, Sol. Brilliant. Okay, well, well, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll leave you to your body born, uh, body boarding and pole dancing <laughs> and <laughs> writing <laughs> and painting and the incredible <laughs> life you, you lead. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm going to go do something right now, actually. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks, Sol. Thank you.